Young adults, how do you start building wealth? If you're a parent, how do you get your young adult to start building wealth? Valerie, is it okay if we kick it off with a million dollar example? Oh, I love that. All right, so here's the million dollar example, all right? We got 50 year timeline. I'm gonna assume that we have maybe a 22 year old that's just got their first job and they're trying to figure out, okay, hey, if I save money, what's the benefit here? If that 22 year old decided to save 200 bucks a month, that's $2,400 a year at an 8% return, they would have, Valerie, $1,377,048. Now, to pause on that, because you might say, okay, yeah, I, I understand money compounds. That's a fair amount of money, but maybe we should just pause real quick. And I'm going to offer up an alternate scenario. Let's say you wait one year. That one year would cost you over $100,000. So if you decide, hey, I'm going to start putting aside 200 bucks a month one year later, and you only save for 49 years, you would have $1,272,822. That's an expensive year, Valerie. It is. Yeah. And we can say, you know, <laughs> I mean, next year, next I don't year, know I'll about have your the hourly. Money. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what your hourly is, but, uh, you know, that's an expensive year to me, over $100,000. This is your life simplified. Welcome in. So I wanted to start with that example because I see the behavioral component as far as building wealth for young adults. That is the most critical component. So we can talk about this compound effect, the benefits of it, but this compound effect can go both ways. That to me is a behavioral component. It's not necessarily, hey, is Coke better than Pepsi as far as stocks are concerned? It's, hey, just getting started with the most valuable asset that we have is time and finding maybe a good, well-diversified fund is in your best interest. Now, we still do need to sort out some of these nuances. So there's the behavioral component. There's these compound examples. Those are great. But you know, we do need to talk about some of these nuances. And I know you want to start with one, Valerie. Yeah. So we can have these really high level ideas, but what we're noticing as uh, parents, if you have teenagers, uh, is it sometimes really just the most basic, simple things that you thought your kids knew? Maybe they don't. So what we wanted to touch on today is some of those things that we thought were common knowledge. Uh, and so saving a little bit each month, absolutely very important. One thing though, I do want to talk about is that little credit plastic pieces of, of things that you put in your wallet uh, mm -hmm. can be very different. So credit cards <laughs> versus debit cards. If you have a debit card, there is this time honored tradition called balancing your checkbook. That is something people don't do anymore for the most part. Once you get to a point where you're not, you know, clearing out your checking account every month, every week, uh, every time you get your paycheck, all of a sudden you're thinking, well, I'm comfortable. I don't really need to worry about that. And that's fine. But a lot of times these teens, they go to school, they have a hundred bucks in their checking account. Then they're using their debit account, their debit card everywhere they go. And they're not realizing that. Once it hits a zero, you could, what we used to call bouncing checks, but you can get a, a non-sufficient funds fee yep. on there. And it basically is just something that it will eat at you. Like you said, that's a kind of a negative compounding is that you'll get transaction after transaction where you are uh, losing more and more money. And so right. just the basics of teaching your kids, okay, this is how you balance a checkbook or at least noticing I've only got 50 bucks left. I can't spend more than $50 until I get a new inflow of cash. Yeah. And so that's absolutely critical that you, you teach your kids. And so we've got your debit card and then we've got your, your credit card. Um, Mike, in your experience, you know, with all those teenagers that um, I know that you do a lot of education with, with teens at, at high schools and things um, with credit cards, there, is there anything in particular that you would want to communicate with them about how they use them? Yeah. I mean, Listen, it, it, there's simple versus easy. I hammer this point home. I've talked about it several times in these different episodes. It's simple to understand how these things work. That doesn't mean it's easy. Mm -hmm. Simple to understand, hey, don't spend more freaking money than you make. People spend more money than they make, right? So with a credit card, it's the behavior again. It is so easy to, again, get, up, you know, obviously approved for some type of limit, spend more money, than you actually have, 
And your future self is the one that's going to feel that pain, not your present self. So that's where people obviously really get in trouble. Now, you know, building credit, uh, it, it would say obviously in the long run, probably a good thing. Um, but if you are going to wade into the waters of credit, it's probably worth understanding how you're going to pay this down each month, right? Because it's just so easy to go beyond what your budget is when you have a credit card limit. So I think it's, it, it's just drilling home that behavior. And again, really, you know, kind of highlighting like, hey, it's not enough just to understand how this works. It's also, you know, following through on the difficulty behaviorally of paying off that credit card bill each and every month. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even just the mechanics of it. Yeah. I used to work at a bank. One of my first jobs was as a bank teller. And once a man, it was a grown up man, but he came in with a credit card bill and handed it to me and gave me money. And I thought like, it wasn't a bank credit card. It was just for some third random third party. And what yeah. I didn't, what I realized is that, you know, we, nowadays we don't necessarily get a bill in the mail. Um, but you have to teach your kids that when you get a bill, you need to either go online or mail it in and actually do something. It's not just some junk mail that you can throw away. And so right. again, very basic, but it sometimes is lost. Um, and to that point, as you said, Mike, with credit cards, if you don't pay off everything that you spent that month, you get interest expense. And so I have credit cards that probably, you know, have a 14, I don't know, double digit ex interest charge on there. If I ever left a balance on there, that doesn't matter because I don't leave a balance on there. I right. pay it off every month. Uh, and so your teens should know that you can get points, you can get cash back, you can get all sorts of great things, but really they're going to uh, reward that responsibility of staying on top of it. Yes. Yes. Uh, again, some key differences there in, uh, you know, just understanding, you know, how these two worked. And I think we have maybe, as, as you pointed out, like this knowledge bias where we just assume that, you know, kids understand these things um, or they understand it enough to where, you know, they can actually, you know, follow through with it and, and do it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond this, uh, we've talked a fair amount about, you know, just student loans. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the importance of, again, it's like a giant credit card. I mean, it's like, as, it's, it's, it's as if we're giving teenagers six figure credit card limits in the form of student loans. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of the problem there is, you know, again, that is a pain that your future self will feel. It's not something that you're going to incur today. Like you don't, feel the effect of not being able to, for example, start a business or buy your first house when you take out that student loan. And so when we're, you know, really, you know, a teenager that's maybe uh, deciding, hey, do I want to take a student loan? Do I, you know, potentially want to work an extra shift a week at whatever job that I have? Because realistically, you know, if you have $10,000 a year in student loans, that's $27 a day. That's a shift and a half for me at mm -hmm. P.F. Chang's in college. Legitimately, like that was a shift and a half a week at PF Chang's. So, you know, you're sacrificial either way here. Like you can either sacrifice a little bit more time and, you know, obviously be able to work a little bit more, get a little bit more income, uh, or you can sacrifice, have a little bit more fun and, you know, versus the opposite. So uh, I think, you know, understanding that and also understanding uh, this is something we'll get into, uh, you know, and we've gotten into a little bit in other episodes as well. Um, it's how you go to college, not necessarily as much where you go to college. So if you're looking at like a $60,000, $70,000 college, as many of the parents uh, a year uh, are, are laying out to me at this moment in time, um, you know, I, I come back to it's much more, you know, how you go to college versus where and pretty much all of the statistical data would would cover this. So um, student loans, again, obviously not free money, just like any loan. And uh, I think, you know, just revisiting, hey, this is a future pain that I'm going to have to deal with. You know, is that right. present gain worth the eventual future pain that I'm going to get from this financial transaction? Absolutely. And I do remember that I, when I was in school, that I had uh, friends that would receive distributions. They would get a check in the mail and they didn't realize that this was a loan. This was a loan and they got a check and they 
I had a friend that took his girlfriend to Disney World with that money. Uh, yeah. I had another friend who's well, like, that, you know, I think I'll I just mean, buy Disney an extra World laptop. Is, Disney World can also be college. <laughs> yes, there is a learning, I mean, I, uh, on how, a learning how component you, to that. How you approach it, right? The, the how you go component there, right? I mean, it can be a four-year For sure. Disney World trip. Right. And sometimes as parents, uh, we want to protect our kids from the big bad world and six figures worth of debt can seem, you know, it's like thinking about infinity or a black hole, you know, it's just like it, it's right. uncomprehensible to them. Yeah, our intuition isn't helpful once, once the numbers get that big. Exactly. And so going through with your teen and saying, OK, this is what the implication is going to be. This is how it's going to be impacting your future. Like you said, you could graduate and have a mortgage payments and no mortgage. So it is going to be really crucial to, to teach your teens what it is that they are getting themselves into, how to yeah. make the payments, how they're going to to be able to afford that later and on. And one note that I would add on to that, you know, before we move on to the next topic is that shared responsibility, I think, is actually a very good thing. So like. Mm. A lot of parents that we work with, you know, have the means to pay for their child's college. Uh, Absolutely. And it's not a question of can, you know, they make this happen or not. But, you know, I, I do think there's something to be said for, you know, from an example standpoint, like what's actually better for, you know, the child's development is instead of just saying, well, yeah, I know it's a $240,000 four-year cost, but we're going to take care of this because, you know, education is the most important thing. It's like, uh, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say that that is always, you know, the best thing to do. I'm not going to step in and say like, hey, this is how you should parent your child. But, you know, something to maybe consider is having that child share some of the responsibility. And if they're looking at a student loan, maybe walk through the arithmetic of just how easy it is to not have to take out that student loan with either some form of a tuition reimbursement plan through some employer or just getting a part time job somewhere. So um, now another key point here. Uh, this was a surprise for me, maybe a surprise for others. The first paycheck I got, I didn't get the full paycheck. And I asked my dad, I was like, what the heck? Like, it says I'm supposed to get 600 bucks. And I got like, where's my money? What's going on? And he started cracking up. And he's like, it's taxes, son. Get used to it. Right. So, what's going on there? What's something you can maybe just, uh, you know, teach your kids as far as like how this works? Yeah, you know, and what's funny about that or ironic is that you not having all your money is a safeguard for yourself in a lot of ways. Tax withholding, understanding taxes, I mean, adults generally don't want to learn or don't learn about it and nobody is a huge fan of it. Uh, but yes, understanding, you know, how much in taxes should you withhold? Um, are you going to need to file taxes? And so in general, one thing you should know um, is that your teen, if they're in college, they could still be required to file their own tax return if they make more than $1,000. Uh, well, depending on the different types of income, but effectively, they need to be aware that there are going to be tax ramifications as far as them working. One thing that uh, is prevalent now are gig jobs. So, and I'm talking about things that either can be you're making something on Etsy or you're working for uh DoorDash or something like that. Does that a get lot taxed? of those it sure does. And it's difficult and it's really painful tax because one, they don't withhold the taxes for you and you yeah. have to pay self-employment taxes. And so standard deductions don't offset that. And so even if you oh. only made, you know, 700 bucks, you know, it's below the standard deduction, but you still have to pay self-employment tax. So okay. hard lesson to learn, but those kids have got to set the money aside on mm. their own to make sure that they're paying for that that liability when tax business owners comes. have to pay taxes too. So yeah, TikTok yep. advice sometimes might be different than that. Yes, um, but <laughs> worth noting. Uh, budgeting. Okay, so uh, the B word, uh, not the most exciting topic, but again, this comes back to simple and easy. Valerie, what are some things we should think about here? You know, like you said, spend what you have, spend what you make. Don't spend more than you make. If we could say that again, don't spend more money than you make. That is just such a message that, you know, that leads to success or failure. You know, no matter how much money you're making, that absolutely is the rule that you have to follow. And so, you know, at when you're in college, it's nice because at that point, maybe your, your bills are probably pretty low. Maybe your insurance, cell phone bill, yeah. your rent, you know, just a few things, but you're thinking you still need, I would still recommend telling your child, okay, this is how much money I'm giving you. 
when are you having to make your payments? And is that enough to make all the payments? And also, are you giving yourself a $70 budget on going out to eat with your friends? Because guess what? You're not making enough money from my right. wallet to to cover that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I would you know, say that really, that cash flow. Yeah. So really, you know, creating an environment where behaving well is easy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're, again, like, don't view yourself as the exception. Like, <laughs> uh, it's, it's dangerous waters to tread in, you know, when it comes to like, well, no, you know, I, I know that I shouldn't spend more than I make. It's like, well, that's not why, you know, people end up mismanaging their money or maybe not building wealth as efficiently as they could uh, it's not because they know that they shouldn't do that it's again the follow through and i think what you can do to create that environment whether it's you know maybe limiting credit cards early on or you know just using debit cards and getting in the habit of you know kind of just tracking what's coming and what's going out so you don't go above that uh you know creating that environment where behaving as well is easy so thank you for tuning in today this is your life simplified if you haven't already make sure to subscribe regardless of what platform you're listening into, to get industry insights from industry professionals here at Mariner Wealth Advisors. Again, my name is Michael McKelvey, joined by Valerie Escobar, Certified Financial Planner. You guys take care. Mariner Wealth Advisors, or MWA, is an SEC-registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in the state of Kansas. Registration of an investment advisor does not imply a certain level of skill or training. MWA is in compliance with the current notice filing requirements opposed upon registered investment advisors by those states in which MWA maintains clients. MWA may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Any subsequent direct communication by MWA with a prospective client shall be conducted by a representative that is either registered or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from registration in the state where the prospective client resides. For additional information, about MWA, including fees and services, please contact MWA or refer to the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Please read the disclosure statement carefully before you invest or send money. The views expressed in this podcast is for educational purposes only and do not take into account any individual personal, financial, legal, or tax considerations. As such, the information contained herein is not intended to be personal, legal, investment, or tax advice. Nothing herein should be relied upon as such, and there is no guarantee that any claims made will come to pass. The opinions are based on information and sources of information deemed to be reliable, but Mariner Wealth Advisors does not warrant the accuracy of the information. Asset allocation diversification is a strategy designed to manage risk, but it cannot ensure a profit or protect against a loss in a declining market. Certified Financial Planner, trademark, CFP, registered trademark, and federally registered CFP with flame design, marks, collect the CFP registered marks are professional certification marks granted in the United States by Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, Inc., also CFP Board. The CFP registered trademark certification is a voluntary certification. No federal or state law or regulation requires financial planners to hold the CFP certification.